Hey everybody, this is Anthony with you again from Biblical Truth Reality. Welcome back to another video. This is going to be the introduction to refuting this man's YouTube channel called Truth Unedited. When it really should be called Truth Edited with his opinions. Something along those lines. He makes this video on why he believes the earth is flat. Yes, I'm not kidding you. He really believes the earth is flat. He claims to be a believer in Yah, Yahshua, Yahuwah, or whatever the heck that Hebrew word is. Now, I'm not against Hebrew. What I am against is people overusing it and over saying it like that's the correct way to speak. The earth is not flat. But you will see in this video, and I'm not going to play the whole video because it's about 37 minutes long. I'm going to play the key main statements that he is very much in error with. Horrendously and hideously incorrect. And I'm going to react and refute his statements. Of course, I'm going to use a phone voice assistant because it's a very long video with my work schedule. I don't have time to do the narration myself. And by the way, he's also a nameless, faceless person. He doesn't say his name or show his face. At least I haven't seen it. But if you guys do know his name, if he has shown his face, please provide that comment in the video. A proof so I can see it for myself. Why would a person not show his face like I'm doing here and say his name? You all know my name, Anthony Lambertini. Why doesn't he show his face? Why doesn't he say his name? I don't know. If he Is he afraid of it? But he, this guy is definitely wrong. Mr. Nameless Faceless is incorrect. His reasoning in this video is so hideously incorrect and illogical nonsense. You'll see it for yourself. Don't believe me. Okay, I'll get the time frame and then play the whole clip that I'm going to refute. And there's many of them, believe me. If you really have your head straight and you know the scripture, you're going to be watching his statements and listening to him thinking, what is he talking about? Wow, oh, that was stupid. Yeah. You see it for yourself. It's quite nutty. Stay tuned. This subject is an important one for multiple reasons, and we will get into many of them. No bigger reason than the fact that belief in this globe spreads a justified reason of disbelief in our creator, and the thought that we are not created beings, but just one version of creation among many others. That's not even supported in the scriptures. That's his opinion, but he's stating it like the fact. Very deceitful thing. People claim a theory but they make it sound like it's a fact. Basing whether or not you accept or deny the creator regarding whether or not you believe in a flat earth or a globe earth, is like telling a child that, whether or not they believe the house they grew up in is a single wide trailer or a double wide trailer, will determine whether or not they are denying their parents existence, or whether their parents are really their parents. That's ridiculous. This guy is obviously grasping at any argument, and so desperate to find any technicality to deny what logical sense and modern-day easily observable science has proven. Here are his main arguments for a flat earth. Where do your thoughts come from on this topic? Why do you feel that the earth is a globe? Did the Bible tell you this? Have you been to space and seen the shape of the earth yourself? Why do you feel so strongly that the earth could not be flat? Those are serious questions I've asked. And if you're honest with yourself, you can understand that the only reason you feel this way is because you have been conditioned to. None of us have been off this earth and been into space. So for anyone to have a conviction on this topic, it's because you're mind controlled to believe so. His first question implies the fallacy argument that if you have not observed it yourself, that means your belief is not valid or justified. The problem with his first question is based on that faulty implication. The way that logic works is, logic basically means correct reasoning and thinking. The only way to correctly reason and think is by three things, facts, reality, and probability. Also logic functions with consistency. If somebody has double standards, that makes them double-minded, as stated in the book of James. Such a person should not be taken seriously. And that is definitely this person in the video. I could ask the same question and apply the principle by asking, 
Have you personally seen George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Julius Caesar, slavery in the 19th century, the Civil War, or the Titanic? If not, then why do you feel so strongly about those things? If you're honest with yourself, then the only reason you feel that way, is that you were conditioned to. None of us have lived in that time to observe such people and events. So for anybody to have a conviction on those topics, is because you are mind-controlled to believe them. This is a slanderous and ridiculing explanation and questioning. It's basically his way of telling you, that the only reason why you believe the earth was round and it's a globe, is because you were lied to, and you were deceived to believe it. Well then, I can use the same principle for all of those people and events I listed and probably many more. Is he willing to use that same principle and apply it to them? Of course not. Therefore, that makes him a double-standard double-minded hypocrite. He likes to cherry-pick where he wants to apply the principle and where he does not. None of us really knows the true look of this earth, because no one has ever left this earth. Maybe I just triggered you naysayers and you're like, well, wait a second, what about this? Slow down, please. We'll get there. I'm talking about us individually. None of us, really with our own eyes, knows what the shape of the earth truly is. So, what matters is what has influenced your thought to believe what you believe. Shape. To form or create. I was shapen in iniquity. Peas. 51. To mold or make into a particular form, to give form or figure to, as, to shape a garment. Grace shaped thee her limbs, and beauty decked thee her face. Prior. To mold, to cast, to regulate, to adjust, to adapt to a purpose. He shapes his plans or designs to the temper of the times. To direct, as, to shape a course. To image, to conceive. Oft my jealousy. Did you see definition number two? To mold or make into a particular form, to give form or figure to, as, to shape a garment. Form. Out of the nine different definitions, the first one is in context with this topic. Notice the specific wording. The shape or external appearance of a body, the figure, as defined by lines and angles. Thus we speak of the form of a circle, the form of a square or triangle, a circular form, the form of the head or of the human body, a handsome form, an ugly form, a frightful form. Recapping on what he said. None of us really knows the true look of this earth because no one has ever left this earth. None of us really with our own eyes knows the shape of the earth truly is. If you don't know, then why are you making this video on why you believe so confidently that it's flat? Flat, is a shape and form of something. You're already contradicting yourself and your entire premise by showing lack of confidence in your statements. Right at the very beginning we have every reason to doubt your words, because you're not even confident yourself. But then later on, you think you are. You see brethren, this is what I'm talking about. The double-mindedness. They say one thing, but then contradict it later at some point. He begins this video with making not-so-confident insecure statements like, well basically we don't know what the form of the earth really is. But then later on he's so confident the earth is flat, and if you believe in a globe, you believe lies from Satan. Yes he makes that statement later on. I watched the entire video. And I will definitely be exposing those statements as well. His lack of confidence and contradicting his own premise by his insecurities, is just as immature, childish, and irresponsible as any other scenario. For example, a murder happens and the police are at the crime scene. Suppose you're one of the witnesses that saw the event happen. They ask you what you saw and this was your statement to them, people have their own opinions and beliefs about what happened, but I'm going to tell you why I believe that man murdered him in this way. However I really don't know exactly how the murder happened because I wasn't there. At that point, do you really think the police are going to treat you as a solid confident witness? No. James 1 6-8 But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And this globe, in our classrooms, was definitely a part of it. Without them ever speaking a word about it, this is on the side of the classroom, and it tells our mental, the earth is a globe. So that was another influence. And then to add to that, by the time we were in middle school, we had science. Actually, it was earth science. And a big part of that time in school was enforcing this indoctrination with solar system projects. 
Did you do them? I remember doing a lot of them. How many of you had to do a project where you created the solar system and showed the planets revolving around the sun? You don't recognize that that's indoctrination? Think about that kind of work. You did this at home. You made sure that you colored the planets and showed, put them into those stakes and showed how they went around the sun. That is work that you actually had to do that was enforcing indoctrination. And then there's also indirect indoctrination, like when they taught us about astronauts and let us eat astronaut food. Every time you hear about one of those Challenger missions or whatever it is going up in the sky, it's all indoctrination. When I was a child, I remember actually wanting to be an astronaut. I remember loving that astronaut food. There's also what we saw on our television in cartoons with like the Jetsons living out of space, and with the multitude of cartoons and movies that show the Earth as a globe and people going into outer space. There's too many of these examples of this for this to ever be denied that this is not in the mainstream. So what is my point? My point is, do you see how much this system has worked to indoctrinate you? Your thought about the globe is not original thought. It is indoctrinated thought that stems from many sources, but for most of us, our education system has been one of the strongest foundations of the indoctrination that we have been ever exposed to. It is the main reason you argue against any other view. Whether you agree with me or not about the shape of the earth, if you are unable to recognize that you were indoctrinated to feel the way that you do, then this subject will not be able to be understood by you. Think of all the other things that are unbiblical that we have been conditioned to believe in. Indoctrination. Instruction in the rudiments and principles of any science, information. Indoctrination is not a bad thing. Giving instruction is not necessarily forcing it. Giving instruction is giving it by authority. It's okay to be indoctrinated in something, as long as you allow the Holy Spirit as your perfect teacher and using logic to come to that conclusion. He's concluding that all those things listed are part of the bad indoctrination process because people are poisoned in their minds to be conditioned to believe it. Basically, he's against education of the world. Does he also think mathematics, 2 plus 2 equals 4, is bad indoctrination? Is every form of education for public school to teach kids bad indoctrination? Are all of those subjects lying to the students about mathematics? You have to be very careful when you're pointing fingers and making wild accusations. I do see and understand that people want to believe that dinosaurs exist, all because you see the word behemoth in the scriptures. Please understand, a behemoth is not a dinosaur. It is important that you do not rationalize the Bible to fit with the doctrines of this world. Behemoth a beast or brute, from an Arabic vert, which signifies, to shut, to lie hid, to be dumb. In F. Dumb, authors are divided in opinion as to the animal intended in scripture by this and may, some supposing it to be an ox, others, an elephant, and Bashar labors to prove it the hippopotamus, or river horse. The latter opinion is most probably. See hippopotamus, the original word in Arabic signifies a brute of beast in general, especially a quadruped. A beast or brute from this source. Dinosaur. 1. Any of a group, dinosauria, of extinct, often very large, carnivorous or herbivorous archosaurian reptiles that have the hind limbs extending directly beneath the body and include chiefly terrestrial, bipedal or quadrupedal ornithitians, such as ankylosaurs and stegosaurs, and sauritians, such as sauropods and theropods, which flourished during the Mesozoic era from the late Triassic period to the end of the Cretaceous period. 2. Any of various large extinct reptiles, such as an ichthyosaur or mosasaur, other than the true dinosaurs. If a behemoth is defined as a beast or brute, authors are divided over what this means, then there is a possibility it could be similar to what a dinosaur is. Job 40:15-18 Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar, the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass, his bones are like bars of iron. Looks like a description of a dinosaur. How about the term, Leviathan? Job 41 1, 19-21 Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook? Or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. Leviathan. An aquatic animal, described in Job 41, 
and mentioned in other passages of Scripture. In Isaiah, it is called the crooked serpent. It is not agreed what animal is intended by the writers, whether the crocodile, the whale, or a species of serpent. The whale, or a great whale. People disagree on what kind of animal this is, but they do generally agree according to sources, that this animal spends a good amount of time in the seas. But Job 41 was clear that he breathes fire. Dragon. A kind of winged serpent, much celebrated in the romances of the Middle Ages. A fiery, shooting meteor, or imaginary serpent. Swift, swift, ye dragons of the night. That dawning may bear the raven's eye. A fierce, violent person, male or female, as, this man or woman is a dragon. A constellation of the northern hemisphere. See Draco, in scripture, dragon seems sometimes to signify a large marine fish or serpent, Isaiah 27. Where the Leviathan is also mentioned, also Psalm 74. Sometimes it seems to signify a venomous land serpent. Psalm 91. The dragon shalt thou trample underfoot. It is often used for the devil, who is called the old serpent. Revelations 20-2. Deuteronomy 32-33 There wine is the poison of dragons, and the cruel venom of asps. Psalm 74-12-14 For God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength, thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces, and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Basically a dragon is defined as a large animal of some sort and form. Could a dragon and a dinosaur be very similar both being reptiles? Yes. Many civilizations have legends and stories about seeing dragons breathing fire, as large brute beast animals. Therefore can the behemoth be a dinosaur, a dragon, or even leviathan? Yes. This has no relevance whatsoever to a flat earth belief. But since he touched on it, I have to deal with it and refute his claim. When believing in this globe spinning around the sun, you have been indoctrinated to believe the worldview of Satan in order to trap you in the strong delusion, and this is what I'm going to prove to you now. So far, you have not proven as fact that this globe belief is from Satan. You have not shown any scripture that the world is flat. So until then, you made a very outrageous exaggerated dramatic claim that has no strength or power to it whatsoever. Therefore, you're pushing your opinion that it's a doctrine from Satan. But we also have to remember, that you claimed at the very beginning that you really don't know the form of the earth anyways. So how can you claim a globe earth belief is from Satan, when you openly admitted that you don't know the form of the earth? That's quite a stretch of an accusation. That's like if you were to report a car being stolen. You gave the exact description of the car, being a 2023 Toyota Camry. But then at the beginning of your statement in the police report you write, well I really don't know the exact make and model of the car anyways. But then later in your statement you point the finger at somebody and claim they stole that Toyota Camry. You're showing a contradiction in your claims. The first part shows insecurity and uncertainty. Later, you're claiming certainty and claiming somebody's evil for believing a certain viewpoint. Part 2. His beliefs for support of a flat earth. So I'm going to explain my influence of why I believe the earth is flat. And maybe the part is, I shouldn't be saying that the earth is flat because I don't know what the shape of the earth actually is. What I do know is that what they're telling us is not real. That's my point. But remember brethren, he's not sure of the form of the earth. So how can he claim to have any influence on why he believes the earth to be flat when he doesn't have any confidence in the form of the earth? Also how can he even explain his influence when he can't even have confidence in that influence he had on the form of the earth that he's not sure of because he's doubtful of it? Seriously? And people are dumb enough to subscribe to his channel and take him at his word and just believe him? Once again, he's contradicting his premise. At the beginning he makes the same claim that we don't know the form of the earth. Then he goes on to believe that if you believe in a global earth, you are deceived and have a view from Satan. But now, he's contradicted himself again by claiming that he should not be saying a flat earth because he doesn't know the shape of the earth actually. No confidence, now confidence, back to no confidence. He's like a teeter-totter on the playground. You can't take him seriously because he's going to bounce from one side to the other. If he can't have confidence to say a flat earth, and admit twice now that he doesn't know what the shape or form of the earth is, then how can he claim that what they've been telling him about a global earth, is not real? How can he conclude to know it's not real if he's not confident about his own belief anyways? 
What a double standard, two-face, lying, slithering snake, hypocrite. So let's go to the scriptures. Anyone that wants to say that they have a biblical understanding of our creation, it is undeniable where any of us should start from. It's obviously the first page, the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. So we'll start there. It says, In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of Elohim was hovering over the face of the waters. Then Elohim said, Let there be light. And there was light. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good. And Elohim divided the light from the darkness. Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus Elohim made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And Elohim called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then Elohim said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And Elohim called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And Elohim saw that it was good. And we'll stop right there. That's Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. The first 10 verses of the Bible. This should be the starting basis for anyone that says they believe in the biblical story of the creation of the earth. And for the most part, we all know this without even reading it. But there's a part that often gets glossed over, and it's this point that I want you to focus on because it should not ever be glossed over. It's highly important. Verses 6 through 8. I'm not going to illustrate it. I just want to read the words. Then Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus Elohim made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And Elohim called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. You saw me illustrate it, but it needs to be discussed. Yahuwah said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So all of a sudden, when reading our Bibles, something is a little different than what we were first taught. But remember, I'm asking you to forget what you heard before. You're learning this biblically. In the creation, there were waters, and Yah created a firmament to divide the water. That's what it says. So this is water, just going according to the scriptures. Yah created something that divided the waters, so now the waters are split into two parts. The waters were divided just as the scriptures say. Now, divided by what? The scripture says firmament. But what is that? Now, to study this more in depth, I like to use the Strong's Concordance as it goes over the actual Hebrew word used when this was written in Hebrew. So if you go to the concordance and we look up firmament, it shows the multiple times that this word is used. And all the times it is used, it is referenced to the same word, which is number 7549 in the Hebrew concordance. When you go there, the word you find is rakiat. That's the word. It's defined as an expanse, i.e. the firmament or apparently visible arch of the sky. Firmament. Okay. Let's get some more clarity, because you see that word, let's talk about it. What does expanse mean in our English language? According to the Oxford Dictionary, an expanse is an area of something, typically land or sea, presenting a wide, continuous surface. Okay, so let's just get that clear. Without anyone else's indoctrination, according to the Bible, when Yah created the heavens and the earth, he made a firmament, which is an expanse, an area of something, Presenting a wide, continuous surface. It is a visible arch of the sky, and he made this to divide the waters from the waters. That's what verse 6 says. Let's read verse 7. Thus Elohim made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. So Yah made this firmament, and he divided the waters, 
And now the division was the waters under the firmament, and now there are waters above the firmament. So in a biblical understanding, there are waters under and above the firmament. Okay. And then verse 8 says, And Elohim called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. So Yah called this firmament heaven. And so heaven divided the waters. So let's just jump back to your indoctrination because I'm sure it's probably screaming out with challenging points. Maybe something like, well, that's fine and true, but it doesn't prove anything. Heaven is above us in space. This means nothing. But it will mean a lot more if you just keep reading on to the third day in verses 9 and 10. Genesis 1, 1 to 10. Verses 6 to 8. Read it carefully. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Notice it says, heaven. Not, heavens. What is the heaven that God created? It's his kingdom that he created first. Remember, God is the only infinite noun, person, place, or thing. He makes his kingdom, heaven, first. Then he makes the earth. Now right here, people want to dismiss outer space or a solar system because it doesn't say heavens in verse 1. That doesn't mean anything because later on he uses the plural form, heavens. I will show that later. Verses 2 to 3 And the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Remember a flat noun is a form and shape, see the definitions given at the beginning. So you cannot say he created it flat just because the verse said it was without form. It means it had no organized substance to it. Also it was void, a lot of gaps and emptiness throughout. The Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. Did God create the waters? Yes. God is the only infinite being. When God said for there to be light, that light came from him. He is the light of all things. He spoke that light into existence coming from him. Verses 4 to 5 And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. That light that came from him, he divided it from the darkness and he called the light, day. The darkness he called, night. That was the end of the first day. Remember, light comes from God and he can organize it however he sees fit. Three things have been established. 1. God created his kingdom and then the earth came along with the heavens. 2. Waters already existed that he created first. Then he spoke out the light to exist. 3. He divided the light from the darkness and called the light day. The darkness he called night, and that was the end of the first day. Now our main text of his attempted proof. Verse 6 And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Firmament. Summary definition is the region of the air, sky, or heavens and expands as a wide extent. Therefore God is literally saying, let there be a region of air or sky in the midst of the waters and have it divide the waters in two. That's what, divide the waters from the waters, means. So this region of air or sky is in the middle of the two groups of waters. Verse 7 And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Here God put the air or sky in the middle, so the waters were above the sky and below the sky. Verse 8 And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, some words have more than one doctrinal teaching. This is one of them. Notice in verse 1 he said he created the heaven and the earth. Again, heaven is singular, but there's two doctrinal teachings here. He created his kingdom, the angels, the cherubims, etc. Then he created the earth come along with the heavens, especially the established heaven called the firmament. God in this verse called the firmament, or air or sky, heaven. Is this the only heaven God created? No. Basic English grammar shows, if you put an, s, at the end of a word, it becomes plural. More than one. Therefore God established his kingdom, the waters, the light that came from him, divided the light from darkness, and then created the firmament as the air or sky to divide the waters into two groups. Let's read. Then Elohim said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And Elohim called the dry land earth, 
and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And Elohim saw that it was good. That's Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. It says the waters under the heavens were gathered into one place and they let dry land appear. It says Yah called the dry land earth and the waters gathered together he called seas. Get it clear. And this is a biblical account of creation. The waters under the firmament were gathered and dry land appeared, which is called earth. The planet is not called the earth. In your indoctrination, they teach you to say planet earth. But in that definition, this includes the water, the skies, and the dry land. The dry land is the earth, and the waters gathered are called the seas. This is a biblical understanding. Please understand that. So before we go any further, how do you get this planet earth that is in space spinning around the sun to fit with what Yah has declared in his word? In order for you to do this, there's going to be a lot of fancy talk and complex answers that contradict these scriptures that do not stem for the word, just so you can force that understanding to f- try to fit something with these scriptures. I know that's what people like to do. I don't accept that way of thinking, and that's where you're running into conflict with me. But let's keep going. Just so we are thorough, let's continue with what Yah has declared in his account of creation. Verses 9 to 10. He says the planet is not called the earth. How do you get this planet earth that is in space spinning around the sun to fit what Yah has declared in his word? Genesis 1 9 and God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. He ordered the waters under the heaven, firmament meaning air or sky, to be gathered to one place. And then let the dry land appear. Verse 10 And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he sees, and God saw that it was good. He called the dry land earth and the waters he gathered together under the firmament he called, seas. Modern term for these are called oceans. Can the world be called earth? Yes. Job 34 13 Who hath given him a charge over the earth? Or who hath disposed the whole world? If the earth cannot be called the world and vice versa then does God have charge over the earth but not over the whole world? And has he disposed the whole world but not charge over the earth? Psalms 33 8 Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. If they are not the same, then does God want all the earth to fear God but not the world? And does he just want the world to be in awe of him but not all the earth? Psalms 89 11 The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine, as for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. If they are not the same, then is the earth God's, but not the world and the fullness thereof? And did he found the world but not the heavens and the earth because they are just his property but he didn't really found them? Psalms 96 13 Before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, he shall judge the world with righteousness, and the people with his truth. Is she coming to judge the earth but only judge the world with righteousness? And will he only judge the world with righteousness but judge the earth however he wants which is the opposite of righteousness? Psalms 98 9 Before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth, with righteousness shall he judge the world, and the people with equity. Is the Lord coming to just judge the earth and only judge the world and the people with equity? Proverbs 8 26 While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. Jeremiah 10 12 He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Important note, if you notice how he illustrates the separation of the waters above and below the firmament, he has the firmament as an dome arch and entitles it as heaven. Vital to keep in mind because he believes the world is basically a disc with a dome shield over it like a snow globe. Scripture nowhere teaches this. But he has deceived himself into thinking it does. It continues to say, Then Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years, and let them be for light in the firmament of the heavens, to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then Elohim made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Elohim set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And Elohim saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. 
That's Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 19. So wait, he doesn't just mention the firmament once. He mentions it multiple times. You've probably read this multiple times. How come you're just noticing it now? It's because the delusion was blocking you from understanding anything that did not fit with what you wanted to know. Your indoctrination blocked you from this word because it didn't fit with the indoctrination. Yah said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day and the night. And he made the stars also. These two great lights are set in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth to rule over day and night. These lights, which we know are the sun and the moon, are what is said to be moving according to divide the day from the night, and they are for signs and seasons and for days and years. Now, as you read this biblical account, where does it say that we are moving around these lights? First of all, let's be clear about the indoctrination. We are told that the moon revolves around the earth, and then the earth revolves around the sun. But this is not what is told to us in the biblical account, in the scriptures. In our indoctrination by this world system, it's told that the moon does not give off its own light. Here's a random article from Washington State University titled, How Does the Moon Glow? It says, unlike a lamp or our sun, the moon doesn't produce its own light. Moonlight is actually sunlight that shines on the moon and bounces off. The light reflects off old volcanoes, craters, and lava flows on the moon's surface. That's what they say. But look how that contradicts the scriptures. Because Yah says he made two great lights, one to rule over the day and the night. The explanations from the world contradict the word. But let's keep going. It must be understood that the Hebrews have their own view of the earth according to Yah, and it is their view that I base my understandings from. You see, you could choose to believe what you want to believe, but I am standing with what the Bible says and not what man has told me. If we were to use the account from Genesis chapter 1 right now, we would be getting something similar to this. This is what it would look like. And this has been depicted many times right in your faces, and you probably don't even recognize it. It's the reason why we have snow globes. They keep telling you, and they show you the truth. Christoph, let me ask you, why do you think that uh, Truman has never come close to discovering the true nature of his world until now? We accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. With which we're presented. But either way, you can't leave or get out of the firmament. Because if you do, you would be going to heaven. That is what the Bible says. Do you understand that? Verses 14 to 19. First I will refute in this section what his statements were, and then I will go through the verses. Notice these verses and the first chapter of Genesis says, Heavens, which this flat head thinker missed. 1. He asks, where does it say that we are moving around these lights? Does it have to say that? No. Just like nowhere does the Bible talk about gravity, does that mean that gravity does not exist? No. From this source. What is gravity? Gravity is the force by which a planet or other body draws objects toward its center. The force of gravity keeps all of the planets in orbit around the sun. What else does gravity do? Why do you land on the ground when you jump up instead of floating off into space? Why do things fall down when you throw them or drop them? The answer is gravity, an invisible force that pulls objects toward each other. Earth's gravity is what keeps you on the ground and what makes things fall. The Bible also does not teach that the sun burns with fire. Does that mean it's not true? No. Just because the Bible does not say something, doesn't mean it's not true. The Bible is not meant to be a science or history book. Rather it's meant to be a book of rules and expectations from God. 2. He criticizes sources stating that the moon doesn't produce its own light. But he uses Genesis 1 14 to 19 to believe the moon gives its own light. Two great lights. That's a lie. The moon doesn't shine light. It reflects the light. Job 25 5 Behold even to the moon, and it shineth not, yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. Ezekiel 32 7 And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven, and make the stars thereof dark, I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. Matthew 24 29 Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, Revelation 21 23 And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, 
for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. The moon does not give its own light, it reflects the light of the sun. It's very clear that the moon only has light as it comes from the sun because it of itself doesn't shine. 3. He says, if we were to use the account of Genesis chapter 1 right now we would be getting something similar to this. Then shows a picture of a flat earth disk dome, like a snow globe. That's a lie. Genesis 1 does not even reveal a flat snow globe of an earth. That's his misinterpretation of these verses. Just because there's a firmament between the two groups of water, does not indicate a dome. 4. He says, you can't leave or get out of the firmament, because if you do you would be going to heaven. That is what the Bible says. Do you understand that? He's another one of these dumb people that says, the Bible says this or the Bible says that, and it doesn't say it. The word, say, basically means to utter in words in exact form, whether written or spoken. Therefore if he's claiming that the Bible says you can't leave the firmament because then you would be going to heaven, then he's a liar. He must be reading a very corrupt Bible because it's not what the KJV says. It's nowhere in the text. No text says, if you leave the firmament you go straight to heaven, regarding God's kingdom. Mr. Nameless, no face showing, flat earth believing, Bible twisting fraud, you lied. You are caught in a lie. He obviously does not know how to count very well. There are three heavens in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 12 1-2 It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. Did you see that? It says he was caught up to the third heaven. You see, when I say, the Bible says, I show you exactly what it says and I go right along with what it actually says in words. It literally says, caught up to the third heaven. That's what it literally says. Whereas, Mr. Faceless Nameless said, you can't leave or get out of the firmament, because if you do you would be going to heaven. That is what the Bible says. You also see, that when I quote somebody else I quote them exactly what they said, word for word, the best I can. Whereas he likes to twist the exact wording of scripture to make it say what it does not say. If you say, the Bible says this or the Bible says that, you better make sure your quotation is factual and literal. If you don't, then you are a text-twisting manipulating liar. Now I will go through the verses. Genesis 1 14-15 And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. The firmament is the air or the sky and God said to let there be lights in this firmament. Notice, he said lights in the firmament, not the moon and the sun in the firmament. Two very different things. For example, you can shine a lamp outside of a room but the light is shining in the room. Would it be accurate to say there is a light in the room? Yes. Is that the same as saying the lamp is in the room? No. Mr. Nameless Faceless, lacks simple elementary logical sense regarding this. Notice carefully in verse 15. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. It says to give light upon the earth. Now he claimed before that the land is called the earth, not the planet. Abusing verses 9 to 10, he said, the planet is not called, the earth. If that's the case, then to be consistent according to this verse, God made the light to only shine upon the land. Not upon the oceans. If that's true, then how is it that oceans can have light from the sun showing upon it? This is a clear indication that he does not apply simple logic to scripture from what he directly observes. He claimed the planet is not called the earth. He believes only the land is called the earth. Well if that's the case, then the sun's light can only shine upon the land. This verse is a clear proof that the planet can be called the earth as well. Along with the other verses revealed before. Mr. Nameless Faceless struck out again. Verse 16 And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, he made the stars also. Once again, you have to compare scripture with scripture. I've already proven that the moon does not give its own light. Rather it reflects the light from the sun. Just because this verse says two great lights, doesn't mean the moon gives its own light. Also notice about the moon, God calls it, the lesser light to rule the night. Verses 17 to 19 And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, 
and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Again, God said he set, the lights, in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. He did not say he put the sun and the moon in the firmament. He said he put them, context is the lights, verse 16. Parable. Suppose I said I made two great lights to shine in the living room. I set the lights in the living room. However, I set two big lamps outside the living room. Would it still be accurate for me to say I set two lights in the living room, but the lamps are shining into the living room from the hallway? Yes. You can set light in a certain place in a room, but with the object itself that brings forth the light to still be shining outside the room. Mr. Nameless Faceless, believes God put the sun and the moon in the firmament, which is again, the air or the sky. Therefore he really believes that the sun and the moon are actually in the earth's atmosphere in the sky. He does not believe in outer space, of course that's what he's implying by his statements. There are more statements in the scriptures that deal with the shape of the earth and how it will look. Let's go to Job chapter 37, verse 18. Look how he describes the firmament. This is Yahuwah speaking. With him, have you spread out the skies, strong as a cast metal mirror? That's the New King James. The King James Version says, Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong, and as a molten looking glass? It says this firmament, it's strong, but also looks as a glass. You see, the sky, it's not strong. I mean, we fly in it all the time when we're in an airplane. The firmament, where Yah placed above us, is strong, and it looks like glass. Look how Ezekiel explains when he's speaking of his vision of Yah in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26. And above the firmament, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. He saw Yah on a throne above the firmament. Oh, well, wait, maybe that's why Yah says this in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. Thus says Yahuwah, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is my place of rest? In your globe doctrine, how is the planet earth Yah's footstool? This is a footstool. Make it make sense. Finally, we can move on to the next accusation he gives. Job 37 18 Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong, and as a molten looking glass? This proves nothing about a flat dome earth. Just because it says the sky is strong and as a molten looking glass, doesn't mean it's a dome. How is it strong? Does this indicate a dome shield wall that will stop anybody from trying to leave the atmosphere? No. This is why it takes a space shuttle to go through the atmosphere because gravity is very strong. An airplane can only go so high in the atmosphere it tilled and just shut off because there's no gravity in space. From Google source. Well, the problem with flying above the troposphere is that the air is too thin to produce any substantial amount of lift for commercial jets. And if a commercial jet doesn't produce enough lift, it won't be able to sustain its cruising speed. Of course, there are exceptions, such as military aircraft. This passage does not teach a dome flat earth. He says, Ezekiel 1:26, You saw Yah on a throne above the firmament. Ezekiel 1:26, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Read this very carefully with simple logic and English grammar that can solve this issue and refute the accusation, from this nameless faceless liar. It says, above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. Literally it means the firmament, or the air or the sky, that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. The sky is over our heads. Not the throne itself. Don't twist what the verse says. Above the firmament, not, in, the firmament that was over their heads. Above, and, in, are two different words. Above, is something beyond the noun. In, indicates being within the noun. If I said, above the roof that was over my head, does that mean something is in the roof or beyond it? Beyond it. The throne is above the firmament, literally meaning it is above the sky because it's in the third heaven. See 2 Corinthians 12. Also this does not indicate the throne being directly above the firmament. He uses Isaiah 66 1. But is wrong again. The key words are, heaven, throne, 
and earth, footstool. This flathead blockhead thinker, obviously missed it. He says, in your globe doctrine, how is the planet earth Yah's footstool? Isaiah 66 1 Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool, where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? If heaven is his throne, which heaven is it? Again, there are three heavens, 2 Corinthians 12. And how is the planet earth his footstool? Footstool. A stool for the feet, that which supports the feet of one when sitting. To make enemies a footstool, is to reduce them to entire subjection. Peas. 110. Psalms 110 1-2 The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Luke 20 43 Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Acts 2 35 Until I make thy foes thy footstool. Do these passages actually mean that God is going to set his feet upon the enemies for relaxation and inclining his feet? No. I often get this question a lot, or people use this in justification of their globe doctrine. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. It says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Again, Yah sits above the circle of the earth. And I, I mean, I absolutely believe this. If you ever know any time that I have ever shown flat earth depictions, it has always been a circle. I believe in that scripture. For some reason, though, somehow people equate a globe with a circle. Those are two different things. You see, this is a globe. It looks like a ball. This is a circle. They are two different things. And maybe you want to say it was lost in translation. So let's look at this other scripture from Isaiah. He says, He will surely turn violently and toss you like a ball into a large country. There you shall die, and there your glorious chariots shall be the shame of your master's house. That's Isaiah chapter 22, verse 18. So let's be clear here. In chapter 40, verse 22, he says circle. But chapter 22, verse 18, he says ball. Let's just go back to Strong's. In chapter 40, verse 22, the word for circle he uses is Strong's number 2329, cube, which means a circle. But in verse 22, verse 18, Strong says another word is used, number 1754, door, which means a ball. He knew the difference when he spoke of the earth. If he meant a globe or a ball, he would have just said it. Please do not make a circle mean a ball or a globe, just so you can make it fit your indoctrination. Either way, chapter 40, verse 22 says, Yah sits above it. How many times do the people in space show Yah sitting above the earth when they go out there? You've never seen it. Listen to how the earth is described in the scriptures. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Well, who stretched a line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? Job chapter 38 verses 4 through 6. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are Yahuwah's and he has set the world upon them. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 8. So the earth has pillars and foundations that have been laid, and Yah set the world upon them. You who laid the foundations of the earth, so that it should not be moved forever. Psalm chapter 104 verse 5. The earth is described as having foundations with a firmament above it. And you know what? The power of this understanding, it makes it quite difficult to deny that we are actually created beings. And this is why Satan desperately does not want the world to understand that we have a firmament above us that we cannot leave. It's very easy to make us that we're not special when you have an outer space and other planets and possible other life forms and all the other nonsense that these people make up. It's very easy to make people believe or not believe in the Bible. But when you understand that we are created beings under a firmament that we cannot leave, it makes denying our creator very difficult. Because who put us here then? You cannot believe the lies of Satan. When we understand the way Yah created the earth 
and makes us praise him. As it said in Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of Elohim and the firmament shows his handiwork. You see that? Many of you guys that are denying the flat earth probably never even made this praise to our father. Praise him. It, the firmament shows his handiwork. Don't let Satan deny that from him. The firmament shows his handiwork and just how close to creation he actually is. Here's another lengthy reputation. One section at a time. Let's talk about Isaiah 40, 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, circle. It's a long definition, so we'll shorten it. In geometry, a plane figure comprehended by a single curved line, called its circumference, every part of which is equally distant from a point called the center. Of course all lines drawn from the center to the circumference or periphery, are equal to each other. In popular use, the line that comprehends the figure, the plane or surface comprehended, and the whole body or solid matter of a round substance, are denominated a circle, a ring, and an orb, the earth. Compass, circuit, as the circle of the forest. There are in context three different definitions for the word, circle. Sphere. In geometry, a solid body contained under a single surface, which in every part is equally distant from a point called its center. The earth is not an exact sphere. The sun appears to be a sphere. Notice he said, the earth is not an exact sphere. He did not say it was flat. Keep this in mind. Globe. A round or spherical solid body, a ball, a sphere, a body whose surface is in every part equidistant from the center. The earth, the terraqueous ball, so called, though not perfectly spherical. An artificial sphere of metal, paper or other matter, on whose convex surface is drawn a map or representation of the earth or of the heavens. That on which the several oceans, seas, continents, isles and countries of the earth are represented, is called a terrestrial globe. That which exhibits a delineation of the constellations in the heavens, is called a celestial globe. A body of soldiers formed into a circle. Globe, to gather round or into a circle. A circle can be, in geometry, a plane figure comprehended by a single curve line, called its circumference, every part of which is equally distant from a point called the center. A glow can be, a round or spherical solid body, a ball, a sphere, a body whose surface is in every part equidistant from the center. Basically the same thing. A circle can be a globe regarding every part which is equally distant. So then when Isaiah 40:22 says, circle, it can mean a globe is a tennis ball, bowling ball, baseball, or a basketball etc. a circle? Yes. Is a key ring a circle? Yes. Mr. Nameless Faceless doesn't have the simple elementary school logical sense to figure this out and understand this. He says, please do not make a circle mean a ball or globe, just so you can make it fit your indoctrination. How many times do the people in space show Yah sitting above the earth when they go out there? You never seen it. Correction. I just did, according to the factual definitions. Obviously almost every word has more than one meaning or definition to it. What do astronauts in space have anything to do with God sitting on the circle of the earth? Nothing. Isaiah 40 22 it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, sit. Long definition, but I will shorten it to stay within context with a summary definition. To physically set body down upon an object. To occupy a seat or place to exercise authority, as sitting in judgment, as a council sits upon life and death. Is God literally setting his body down upon the earth? No. Now when he was here on the planet, yes he did sit down, he did occupy a seat in the synagogues etc. but he also exercised authority as sitting in judgment. He cast out the money changers, preached with authority, judged the Pharisees with authority. So when it says in Isaiah 40 22, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out, as a tent to dwell in, obviously he is exercising authority because we are very little in his sight. A circle can mean a globe, according to the literal factual definitions. 2. For Job 34 4-6 and 1 Samuel 2 8. He says, the earth has pillars and foundations that have been laid and Yah set the world upon them. Pillars of the earth. Flat earth claim, 
they use 1 Samuel 2 8 and Job 9 6 to teach that the earth is on sturdy pillars. 1 Samuel 2 8 He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. Job 9 6 Which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble. Does this really mean there are literal pillars? Really? Pillar. A kind or irregular column round and insulate, but deviating from the proportions of a just column. A supporter, that which sustains or upholds, that on which some superstructure rests. A monument raised to commemorate any person or remarkable transaction. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave. Something resembling a pillar, as a pillar of salt. So a pillar of a cloud, a pillar of fire. Foundation, support. In ships, a square or round timber fixed perpendicularly under the middle of the beams for supporting the decks. In the manigi, the center of the volta, ring or manigi ground, around which a horse turns. There are also pillars on the circumference or side, placed at certain distances by two and two. Since when has there ever been actual pillars supporting earth? I've never seen them. Also they forget Job 26 7, he stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon, nothing. How can the earth hang on nothing, yet have pillars supporting it? Use logical sense. If a pillar can be defined as definition number 5 as, foundation, support, then what is the foundation of earth? Land holding it up. People forget that if you find the bottom of any lake, creek, or ocean, you'll find there's dirt underneath. These continents are not floating around like lily pads. They're all connected. It's just the low places are filled with water. That are the pillars. Remember, not everything in scripture is to be taken literally without figurative meaning. Last section of his erroneous claims. 3. Psalms 104 5. He says, The earth is described as having foundations with a firmament above it. He shows a picture of the globe world and crosses it out stating we cannot believe the lies of Satan. Psalms 104 5 Who laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. Does forever mean eternal? Yes but it's a metaphor most of the time in scripture. It does not mean it will never end literally because it's applied to the circumstance or what's being said. These scriptures refute the idea that this earth will be around for eternity. Isaiah 66 22 For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. 2 Peter 3 3, 7, 12 to 13 Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Revelation 21 1 And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. The phrase, forever, is figurative. For example, if I said, this book is taken forever to read, does that mean it's going to take eternity to read? No. I'm using it as a metaphor, that it's taking a very long time to read and I don't know when I will finish the book. By the way, if you take an actual globe and stand on it, would the globe be my foundation for holding me up? Yes. Foundation. To stay in context I will show just three definitions. The basis of an edifice, that part of a building which lies on the ground, usually a wall of stone which supports the edifice. The act of fixing the basis. The basis or groundwork, or anything, that on which anything stands, and by which it is supported. Establishment, settlement. If a foundation can be anything by which anything stands or may be supported, then can I stand on a globe and be supported by it? Yes. Could God physically and literally stand on the globe earth if he wanted to? Yes. Just as well, if not more so, than he could on a flat earth. 5. Psalms 19 1 The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Again, it says the word, heavens. This flat head thinker missed it. Finally, he's concluding the video by making this long exaggerated obnoxious explanation that they are all lying to us. Shows a space shuttle astronauts, the astronauts on the moon, etc. Now I want to deviate to a side point of explanation. There's one thing he did not explain in the video. 
he mentioned the waters above and below the firmament. But he did not explain what happened to the waters above the firmament. Let's read those verses again. Genesis 1 6-9 And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. Notice God did not say what happened to the waters above the firmament. Did God forget to tell us something? No. Is it important to know what happened to the waters above the firmament? No. There are a lot of theories about what happened to the waters. But here's what I believe with some scripture to give suggestions Psalms 148 4 Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. So there are still waters above the heavens. Remember, heavens, is plural. As already proven, there are three heavens and the third heaven is where God's kingdom is. The first heaven is the sky or called the firmament where the birds fly. The second is outer space where the solar system is. The last is the third heaven where God lives in his kingdom. Are there waters above God's kingdom? No, there's no scripture that teaches this. However when it says, heavens in that verse, it's referring to above the firmament, the sky and the solar system. Genesis 2 4 to 6 These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. It had not rained upon the earth because it was not needed. A mist from the earth is all that was needed. Genesis 7 4 For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. God caused it to rain for wrath reasons. Verses 10 to 12 And it came to pass after seven days, that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. It says, all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Which heaven? That would be the firmament, or the sky. So the windows of heaven were probably not opened until that time. Rain came from the fountains of the great deep, the oceans, and from heaven. Could that be relevant to the waters that were above the firmament? Yes. I believe they were reserved above the sky in the solar system until the appropriate time to be used. From this source. A cloud is made of water drops or ice crystals floating in the sky. There are many kinds of clouds. Clouds are an important part of Earth's weather. How do clouds form? The sky can be full of water. But most of the time you can't see the water. The drops of water are too small to see. They have turned into a gas called water vapor. As the water vapor goes higher in the sky, the air gets cooler. The cooler air causes the water droplets to start to stick to things like bits of dust, ice or sea salt. What are some types of clouds? Clouds get their names in two ways. One way is by where they are found in the sky. Some clouds are high up in the sky. Low clouds form closer to Earth's surface. In fact, low clouds can even touch the ground. These clouds are called fog. Middle clouds are found between low and high clouds. Another way clouds are named is by their shape. Cirrus clouds are high clouds. They look like feathers. Cumulus clouds are middle clouds. These clouds look like giant cotton balls in the sky. Stratus clouds are low clouds. They cover the sky like bed sheets. What causes rain? Most of the water in clouds is in very small droplets. The droplets are so light they float in the air. Sometimes those droplets join with other droplets. Then they turn into larger drops. When that happens, gravity causes them to fall to earth. We call the falling water drops rain. When the air is colder, the water may form snowflakes instead. Freezing rain, sleet or even hail can fall from clouds. It's a mystery. We do not know for sure what happened to the waters that were above the firmament. But here's what I believe according to scripture evidence. It's commonly called the canopy theory. Again, it's just a theory. I'm not dogmatic on it, 
but that's the position I believe because it looks consistent with evidence from Scripture. I do believe that the waters above the firmament were either a bubble of water or an ice of water around the earth. Then at the right time when God said the flood will take place God opened the heaven and the fountains of the deep to bring water to flood the earth. Now according to that verse in Psalms, I think it was Psalms 148 that I provided, where it basically states that the waters that be above the firmament. Therefore there are still water in space somehow above the sky. I don't understand where it is or the other five W's to explain the waters. A lot of them are in clouds, since according to sources, the clouds are nearly 100% water. There's a cycle that scientists have discovered. Words like precipitation, condensation, etc. I don't understand how that all works, but that's what sources claim basically. Does the waters above the firmament prove or disprove a flat earth? Neither. The waters above the firmament can work for both belief models. However, it's important to understand that you should never take some evidence that's mostly neutral and use it to support your theory and claim its fact. That's where the fairy tale dangerous theology comes in. The waters above the firmament don't prove or disprove a flat earth or globe. So we can't use the waters above the firmament as proof, for or against. Conclusion. This is the problem with flathead airhead thinkers like Mr. Nameless Faceless. His channel should actually be called, Truth Edited and Changed to Fit Opinions. People like him will dismiss any evidence you show. If an astronaut returns from space with video footage, pictures, and personal testimony along with a witness of three or more others that were with him, he will just dismiss it. He doesn't care what they have to say or what evidence they have to show to prove they were actually in outer space. He also will dismiss any evidence, including probably video footage of the Earth rotating from left to right for a full 24 hours to show it's not flat. He doesn't care what the evidence is, he will just dismiss it and deny it and call them liars. These are people are dumb, on, purpose. There's no point talking to them. It's like trying to convince a person who denies a chair in the room actually exists when we know it does. He rejects reality and logical sense. He doesn't care what reality shows because he doesn't trust what his eyes sees and what logic reveals. Mr. Nameless Faceless is one of these willfully ignorant people who's been crippled by his own opinions of his private interpretations of scripture.